So the title of my talk is Advanced Power and Propulsion for Mars and Beyond. This is a little bit of a, you know, I'm not going to get into deep theory on this, but just a bunch of concepts. And um, I'll be talking, I'll just do a brief introduction of myself. Uh, we'll talk about present technologies for uh, power and propulsion, near-term power for propulsion in seven months, near-term propulsion, breakthrough power for heaven and earth, and then breakthrough propulsion. And uh, then, of course, I'll summarize. Uh, personal introduction, I'm a plasma physicist. I uh, spent uh, most a great deal of my career working on controlled uh, magnetic fusion energy, some work on uh, inertial confinement. But, uh, you know, uh, Give, give, me, give me a good lightning storm and a cold bottle of beer, and I'm happy. Uh, so, um, uh, I just moved here recently from what I call Planet Wisconsin, Planet in the outer solar system, so it's very cold. And uh, But it gives you some idea of the energy mix we're talking about on this planet in general. Um, coal is what powers most of, of the society on Earth. Um, about, in, at least in Wisconsin and in the rest of the country, about one quarter comes from natural gas, which is, of course, puts out much less greenhouse gas, so that's good. Um, but uh, one, one guy told me, he says, the future of power is coal, John. And um, I presented that deeply. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so then we have we have nuclear in Wisconsin. Uh, my joke to the person who was a big proponent of wind and sail, uh, wind and solar was in the middle of winter I'd drive into work to the physics department where I taught and uh, at uh, Madison College and there'd be no wind and there'd be no sun and I'd say, Josh, there's no wind, sun, why are the lights on? And it turns out it's natural gas and nuclear and coal. <laughs> so that's what we have now for power. Um, our present propulsion technologies are based primarily on combustion. That's what we do the heavy lifting with. Um, solar was <coughs> one of the first sources of space power to provide power for propulsion. Fission and radiothermal generators as power have been demonstrated for space. Fusion is the power of the sun and the stars, and it is being harnessed on Earth. However, it's not to make power, it's to make money. So I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, the trouble began with Prometheus, <laughs> who felt badly for the human race that uh, we didn't have anything to keep us warm at night. Okay, so uh, he gave us fire. The gods were furious with him for doing that knowing that this would lead to global warming later. <laughs> <laughs> so they arranged to have an eagle peck his liver out every day. So, uh, But uh, there's no question that the introduction of fire to human society was a very important step in our evolution. For one thing, we could cook food and thus get better, uh, a better caloric uh, value out of it. And this apparently increased our brain development. So, um, uh, but there have always been problems with combustion. So, anybody who says that, uh, I remember um, the saying in uh, Oregon where I grew up as I was leaving to go to graduate school was, uh, split wood, not atoms. Well, <laughs> it's much better to split atoms as it turns out. So, uh, anyway. We are facing, apparently, global climate change. Um, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, even though it's uh, not the closest to the sun. Uh, most of that greenhouse gas, by the way, is, is water vapor, as it turns out, not CO2. But um, climate has changed in human history, usually bad results. One of the reasons, apparently, we're having so much trouble in the Middle East is that the, uh, they're facing kind of drought conditions continuously. It's raised the price of food. 
or suffer, they can't afford to live, and so they cause revolts in um, several places that already had unstable politics. So uh, I wrote a book about this back in 2001, and I said, the human race is predisposed to misery and mindless bloodshed, even without a climate change. So why, why do this? So, first of all, let's recognize that solar power was developed for space. This is the Vanguard One. Of course, there it is blowing up. But it eventually did something like it did get into space. And um, so solar has always been a part of um, space power. And that space power then ended up on Earth, like a lot of other things developed for space. Then, of course, we have vision. Fission powers much of the Earth's economy. 87% of France's electric power comes from fission. The Germans are shutting down all their nuclear plants, and then they're buying power from France. <laughs> <laughs> generates it with. So it's, uh, uh, anyways, it's a strange situation. But the French have become masters of safe nuclear power. And if they can electrify their transportation system, ours, they will become the first major nation to produce no greenhouse gas, appreciable greenhouse gases. And I salute them for that. Uh, fission, of course, has powered satellites. And uh, radioactive decay heat from fission products um, is still running the Voyagers. Fusion energy, which I worked on, uh, has advanced considerably. Uh, however, its major application now is to produce high-energy neutron fluxes to produce medical isotopes. Fusion is the basis for a very profitable industry now. And that, it turns out, is headquartered in Wisconsin, basically, Phoenix. So, um, also, um, there's a dirty little secret about magnetic fusion that no one talks about much, and that is the 14 MeV neutrons from fusion, tear all the structural steel apart in a nuclear reactor. So trying to produce many times break even in a tokamak or something um, is just ruinous to the structure. They, they're going to have to have a breakthrough in materials to allow that. But um, we have fission right now, uh, solar fission and RTG can provide very useful um, things for a Mars settlement. Fission can provide reliable site power for bases independent of weather. Uh, it's amazing how the planet with so little atmosphere has such terrible weather, but Mars does. And uh, so also uh, you can provide uh, solar for many facilities and outposts. RTGs can provide backup power emergency power for outposts and even human outposts. And fission power plants, we have them good enough. They can expand human habitation to the outer solar system. Uh, I have shown here a Mars global dust storm. Uh, that means you can't power a, a Martian settlement with solar. You put everyone at, at, at profound risk. The astronauts have already weighed in on this and said they will not go to Mars without fusion power, fission power. And uh, also, um, if you're stuck in a six-month global dust storm, there's nothing nicer than to have at least one enclosure everyone can retreat to with an RTG there that has no moving parts and puts out a lot of heat in addition to power. You can run your microwave oven for your croissants. <laughs> and uh, cuddle up to it at night so you can get a good night's sleep. So that was depicted in the Martian. So what do we have right now as far as propulsion? Well, it hasn't changed much from the 60s. Box hydrogen fuel is still the best uh, thing. But also, that can be made anywhere where there is water. And there's a lot of water out there. Water is, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. 
and helium is the next. And the third most abundant element is oxygen. So water is the most abundant chemical compound in the universe. It's a great way to store hydrogen. So if you have a, uh, if you find a bunch of water, you can make locks hydrogen by electrolysis. Um, now, that hasn't stopped people from trying to improve on this with fluorine hydrogen propulsion. I bring this up because I want to make the point that not everything that can be done should be done. Uh, they tried to make fluorine hydrogen propulsion work, and it was just too toxic and too dangerous to be of any of practical use. Um, I worked with some people at Sandia Labs who were working on um, fluorine hydrogen for lasers. And they were told by their management that if anything goes wrong, stay in the control room. It's the safest place <laughs> in the facility. The facility was out in the middle of the uh, and, uh, and uh, they, the account they gave was they're running this thing, and then something goes wrong, and all the lights light up red, and then there's a sh rather sharp explosion. So they all looked at each other and sat there because that's what they were told by management to do. And um, then there was another explosion. <laughs> they all looked at each other again. And the third explosion, they all got up and ran from the, from the control room and got out of the building and it was far away from them as they possibly could. Uh, so uh, fluorine is just one of those marvelous things that is more trouble than it's worth, even though it, in, in a one-dimensional sense, gives you great performance. Now, for more advanced propulsion, we're going, of course, to heavily to Electric propulsion, it's been a great revolution over the last couple decades. Uh, we have, of course, the Hall thruster using xenon. A really nice piece of plasma physics. I salute whoever got it going over there in Russia. And, of course, then they, the Cold War ended and they sold them all these space-tested uh, thrusters to us. Uh, there's also the Vazma plasma engine, which is a variant on... Uh, fusion reactor mirror um, that also appears to work. Um, I myself made a contribution um, that's now recently been appreciated. The MET or microwave electrothermal thruster uh, using water as the propellant. Um, I invented it <laughs> and got a nice patent on it, but of course the patent ran out and uh, the patent wasn't owned by me, it was owned by the company that funded the research. So. Uh, but it's now being flown in space by momentous, and that's about as much satisfaction as any plasma physicist can expect of it. <laughs> he invents something that ends up in space. And just to demonstrate, going to drink some rocket fuel. <laughs> and of course, I've shown Mars there with its northern polar cap, which is ice. That's our fuel due bill. You can refuel at just about any place in the solar system for a water-based thing. The uh, Hall thruster is very nice, but it uses xenon gas, which is rare and very expensive. So. Uh, we're getting good performance out of Momentus. It's so good they won't tell me how good it is. So um, uh, they hired me as a consultant. So. <laughs> anyway, now, advanced power for heaven and earth. Fusion has gotten good enough that it can start impacting our long-term energy planning. Not as a pure reactor, for reasons I described. The neutron flux is just ruinous for the structural um, of any, fug uh, any fusion reactor. But at lower levels, below Q equals 1, you can use it to transmute nuclear waste from fission. 
room, so that it is now 50-year waste instead of 10,000-year waste. This changes everything. Not only that, you can put a fusion neutron source inside a nuclear reactor, in the core of a nuclear reactor, to control its criticality and make it almost melt prop down proof. So the two problems with fission, meltdown and high level waste, can be solved because we now have fusion technology. So I hope that will be making an impact over the next 10 years. My opinion, the energy of economic problem on Earth is solved by hybrid fusion vision. Don't eat your children. <laughs> <laughs> now, ultimately, we will get uh, fusion power uh, using de helium 3, where the instead of neutrons that emits charged particles, um, this is, of course, all the helium-3 is on the moon. As soon as we start harnessing helium-3 on Earth, uh, I, this is the, I show the Jet Tokamak. I visited the Jet Tokamak just the day after they uh, released 100 kilowatts of um, pure fusion power using the helium-3, and they had no radiation whatsoever. They sent the technicians into the tank right after they were done. It was kind of a little class, a little test. Um, so, <laughs> however, uh, once you harness helium-3 on Earth, it will make the moon extremely valuable. Enough to tempt various nations into maybe making outrageous claims. Including this nation, even. Now, uh, there are people who are proposing we can create an even more advanced propulsion um, through antimatter. And um, this is like fluorine as an oxidizer. It looks good on PowerPoint, but uh, uh, this reminds me of the perhaps mythical legend in uh, defense research of the Nitroglycerin powered armored car <laughs> by an unknown agency. Uh, the, everything it got incredibly good mileage, but then hit a pothole. <laughs> so, uh, not everything that should be, can be done should be done. Uh, we can eventually make fusion into um, propulsion directly. It's kind of like mixing uh, fuel and oxidizer. Now, I have the privilege of being part of the mock effect thruster project uh, pioneered by Professor James Woodward at uh, Cal State Fullerton, being funded by NASA. It's based on the mock effect, which was pioneered by Einstein himself. Um, <coughs> we're producing thrust. It's not very much. So people are grumpy with us that they, they, they were shouting at us, more thrust, more thrust at the last meeting, you know. <coughs> so, but we seem to be uh, producing thrust from this interesting effect, first predicted by Einstein. Um, and so... If you want to know, the, uh, the, the very basic theory is that uh, the Mach thrusters generates thrust by transferring momentum to the surrounding space-time, which is connected to all its surrounding masses. So um, it's not really violating any, any uh, conservation momentum or anything. But anyway, stay tuned for hopefully more thrust. <laughs> the captain has ordered more thrust. Now. Ultimately, of course, we want control of space-time. Uh, we want to become spacefaring. We want Mars to be the gateway to the stars. And uh, we need to be able to control space-time structure somehow. 
hopefully with electromagnetism. Uh, I was content for a while that I had invented this water-based plasma thruster. And um, it worked pretty well. And, uh, but, what would be even better than using water as propellant is space-time itself. Now, there are a lot of people working on this in string theory. Well, they're not working, they're not working on space propulsion. I am working on space propulsion. <laughs> they are working on who knows what. Uh, but anyway, they're trying to develop uh, through string theory, supersymmetry, uh, other advanced theories, ways that uh, you can couple um, space-time to electromagnetism. And I just got done presenting my own work on that, the American Physical Society meeting. And um, turns out, at least in my theory, the answer is 42.8503, the answer to life, uh, the universe, and everything. And uh, I did manage to get a highly accurate formula for big G that's model-derived. So I presented that. As I got to the meeting, I was deeply afraid that I would be ignored. <laughs> but to my delight, I was met instead by an angry mob. Torches <laughs> <laughs> and pitchforks. Hey, somebody has to do this. I'm just trying to get to Mars cheap and quick. And one has to bend a little space time <laughs> to do that. So, anyway, uh, I got Big G. <laughs> and um, and I, it's published in a referee journal. So uh, anyway, uh, some person even smarter than me is going to figure this out. My uh, my own work is admittedly rudimentary, and um, uh, but someone has to try. So I'm trying, and I've. Um, more, ex more success than I expected. Um, my first attempt was resulted in a formula for Big G that was close, but not not very accurate. So finally, I checked and I thought, well, how far is it off from the real value? And it was off by exactly a factor of 137. Just a fine structure constant. So I, I remember like the electric shock going through me. I thought, oh my God. Now I'm in terrible trouble. <laughs> so anyway, um, now, once you can mess around with space time, uh, there are people around saying that you can uh, derive power from the zero point energy, the zero point fluctuating energy in the vacuum. Uh, however, if you um, follow uh, Andra Sakharov's interpretation of gravity using zero point, um, this is basically equivalent to uh, creating a, a black hole and then feeding it <laughs> things you don't need in your basement. Uh, kind of like um, <laughs> little shop of horrors. <laughs> You know, and you ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong with this power source? So I, I discourage people from trying to create black holes and harness power from them. Not everything that can be done should be done. So now, why, are we want, why do we actually want to become spacefaring? Well, um, the ultimate goal, I think, is there is a community of intelligent peoples in the cosmos, and we should seek to take our place in that community. That doesn't mean it will be boring. Uh, the good news is they're probably a lot like us, and the bad news is they're probably a lot like us. <laughs> so, but if we want to become spacecraft, 
we should restore the earth also. It will be an excellent character reference, I think, to other species to show them that we haven't trashed our own planet. And uh, this one graph, by the way, uh, shows not CO2, but oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. You can debate what the CO2 is doing all you want, but oxygen itself is declining on this little spaceship. So our, yes, check it out, oxygen depletion in the atmosphere. It's now been known for a long time since we published it at a meeting in about 2001. And so uh, we have pushed life support systems on this little spaceship we're riding way out of balance. We're sort of like in the Apollo 13 situation. So it's not a serious problem. We still have an enormous amount of oxygen downstream. But to intelligent people, this is certainly not a good sign. It means we have to change things. And this should be the basis for all of our power. And, you know, if we stop global warming, and we also have a few Fukushima's or something, <laughs> I, think, I think that's still a good trade. So anyway, we have to make progress on this. And I believe the technologies we'll be developing from space, for space, for Mars colonization, will help us do that. I want you to know, that the Earth has a tremendous capacity to heal itself and help. Look, I mean, the Permian extinction happened. The Chicxulub asteroid hit. And the Earth recovered. It can recover from us. So, I mean, I, I, lived, I worked at the Kennedy Space Center, and we had all these alligators. And in the 60s, they were, they were considered on their way to extinction. I mean, the alligator was voted least likely to uh, pro to uh, succeed in his high school yearbook. <laughs> Nobody thought it could coexist with humans in the modern world. And the bald eagle, they thought probably the same way. But both of them have roared back, especially the alligator, <laughs> gone from being in danger to being dangerous. And People reforest places. You can reforest places. It makes oxygen, which is good. <laughs> so all of this talk, like we're going to fall off some climatic cliff in 14 years, is only if we let it happen. So summary. Mix of old and new technologies promises great advances in propulsion and power for Mars and beyond to make us spacefaring. We should use these technologies to also restore the Earth to a healthy biosphere. It can be done. Go back. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Yes? How long does the momentum get from one place to another? Um, well, it's... That's a very good question, <laughs> because the equations of general relativity, if you take the divergence of that equation to look for the, where the momentum is traveling, the part that, you know, all the gravity stuff goes to zero. What you're left with is the momentum tensor stressed momentum tensor, the part that's carrying the momentum, and it's gradient with the local space time. So I think you have to uh, imagine, well, you can do a calculation where you have a spinning sphere and then do a what called pendulum. That's a, and, you can see, and you can see that their frame dragging will cause the, the it, but, does that explain how the momentum is getting from one place to another because everything has to conserve momentum? 
Um, no, I think you have to go into a deeper theory of relating gravity. E electromagnetic fields transfer momentum like nobody's business. We know that. Gravity fields, despite the fact that you can have two double stars orbiting each other, they're obviously transferring momentum, but you can't really find out where the momentum resides in the gravity field because there is no gravity energy stress sensor. So you have to kind of go beyond that to come up with an electrodynamic theory such as Sakharov's zero point to have the underlying um, basis for gravity to be something electrodynamic because electrodynamics transfers momentum very well. And um, and I believe that once you do that, you'll see that um, um, things that look like they're creating momentum here are actually compensating for it elsewhere in the universe. Um,